How's everybody doing today? So today is about CI excellence with test automation engineers and how we're changing that culture at Gannett. But before I get started, a lot of people don't even know what Gannett is. I say Gannett and they're like, Gannett? US Today, everybody's kind of heard of. It's a newspaper. But I work on the digital side of that, how we're trying to create digital solutions for mobile, desktop, and virtuality. So, I'm really responsible for you know, developing testing solutions um, for all the teams at Gannett. Uh, and we de develop also um, testing strategies for these teams to ensure that they're doing the things in the right way from an automated standpoint. That allows us to make sure that we're building test coverage in your whole entire CI pipeline. About nine months ago, I volunteered to be the champion of CI across all the products at Gannett. And so part of this process to understand the scale that we have at Gannett, USA Today allows us for that national reach of news. But a lot of people don't realize that we have 109 other local news media markets around the nation. Well, if you start thinking about that, trying to actually, the challenge for us is building and testing and deploying all these apps for mobile, desktop, whatever, becomes a challenge. So today what I want to do is share that story of how we're trying to make that change and how test automation is becoming that leader and champion of CI at Gannett. Your takeaways today is kind of our culture, how we're trying to change that culture and how test automation is getting more involved and how we're actually doing this and how we're getting teams familiar of using these new processes. Understand how they're setting those standards up front with the team so everybody's on the same page. I'm not talking about one team at Gannett. We have almost 40 teams doing all kinds of things. And lastly, that new experience where test automation is getting more involved in that part of CI and then development. So the evolution of you know, continuous integration at Gannett kind of really started about three and a half, four years ago before I was even there, was a very slow manual crawl. And then they learned how to kind of walk. And this is when automation was introduced from DevOps and test automation. And this is when I joined Gannett. As of today, we're kind of more running in the sense of having a repeatable and disposable infrastructure. And this all was all part of a self-service model. We have an individual PaaS team that we're developing these solutions so the developers have these tools that they can embed into their products. Well, I'm doing the exact same thing with continuous integration with Chef. Um, it allows us to build you know, a Jenkins master and we were able to re-spin that up or have a Jenkins worker based on whatever product they're working on. So let me take a few minutes to kind of talk about one of the teams that we use as our proof of concept about nine months ago last summer. And that's our mobile team. Um, I started with the Android team because they was very willing to you know, kind of adapt this new strategy. They wanted to move faster. We had to build a bunch of apps. So the challenges with that manual process is it was taking them weeks to build and test these you know, hundreds of apps. But for us, it's 110 times two, which is 220 mobile apps that we have to push out if we want to release something new. And that manual process, something always goes wrong at the beginning or somewhere at the end of a testing station that it results in many iterations and took us weeks to have a release candidate. So, Two years ago, when I kind of joined, um, automation was kind of introduced to where you know, we were starting to do more test automation. Some continuous integration tools were introduced. Where we're moving faster, but we hit this bottleneck to where we couldn't scale up because we was using an on-premise solution because it was a Jenkins server sitting on a developer's desk and had a few executors. And it would take us almost all day to build all the apps. So, Last summer, I was like, it's time to kind of make that change. And I, I took the responsibility to champion this and allow us to try to start building that really the repeatable and disposable infrastructure using you know, Chef and Scalar and some of the tools I'll talk later in this presentation. But this allows us to move faster and be repeatable. And, and that allows teams to now start adopting this new culture. So our vision was really clear. 
the culture had to change. And like any type of change, it results in some of these early adopters. It's like if a new phone is released, right? You have the people that's going to adopt it early, and then you get the people that kind of resist that change. We have the same problem even today at Gannett, is we have several teams that are working on cutting edge technologies, but then we have other teams using legacy stuff. But our whole goal with this is that every, we think that everybody on the team owns quality. It's not a QA effort. And to do this, we need to start shifting more left with DevOps and you know, automated testing. By doing this, it's enabling faster feedback to the teams. We're able to find you know, issues sooner than later. It's not at the end of this whole thing. And so our mission is that all the teams should be practicing continuous integration. And to do this, it really will take a community to do it. It's a team. Your team is a community. It's everybody. Everybody needs to be collaborating as a team. They need to be planning for this and understanding how to build in quality at every single stage. Because if you're not doing that, you're setting yourself up for some failure. And even when you have it into every single stage, you also need to think about testing at your dev environments, your pre-prod, and even production. Even if you roll the production, you should be doing some type of testing. So the expectations is really you know, important. So by setting those expectations and clear goals up front, it's putting you on the right path to success in, in this CI model. And so let me walk through some of those clear goals that we do. We, it's really important to always have someone championing like test automation to you know, a dev lead. And for me, I'm championing continuous integration with the team trying to set those best practices, trying to enable teams to adapt our new model of CI, because we feel like it's going to make a change for others. It's going to set us up to be more successful. But some of those other goals is making sure that we have a community ownership. It's more than just one individual. It's the whole team. Everybody should be thinking about quality. They should be thinking about how we can test more continuously. How can we build faster and give faster feedback? The team should be talking about building that <clears throat> quality into every stage. And I will be helping them on the way to understand how to build those strategies. And I'll talk a little bit later about how some of those strategies will be built into the team. And that could vary from any product or any team. But lastly, the one thing that I feel like we do a really good job that we set clear is publishing changes or anything new that we're going to roll out to the teams. And I'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation. But as you kind of set those expectations, it's about, it's about adapting. If you don't adapt, you have to be adaptive. Because if you're not seeking for improvement every day, you can kind of be left behind. And it sets you kind of up for some failure. And so one of the things that we really stress is try something out. Evaluate new tools or new processes or new methodologies. If you fail, then we'll move on. But if we do find a solution that will work for our team, then what we do a really good job with is sharing that information with the team. We spend a lot of time demoing new features or tools out to that team but the one thing I think we do an excellent job is our documentation around creating these self-service interactive workshops of any new tool that we roll out to the team. If they want to get familiar with Selenium 3 or a new testing framework, we have a workshop that gets them through that. The same with Jenkins. It gets you from point A to point B to get to production. And it shows them how to do the things. It has all the standards built in. And that gives you that, it starts building that confidence into the team in the sense of, they're seeing this. They're seeing the success stories of other people because you're sharing that story with others. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today, to kind of share what I'm doing. But later, if you see me in the hall, please share me some of your stories because I might not be doing something in my whole you know, CI infrastructure that may help us. So understanding you know, Gannett's in engineering, you've heard me say we have 40 teams. That's from you know, mobile teams. We have local developers on news sites um, from virtuality stories to mobile apps, desktop. I mean, we have a very e-commerce. But the one thing that has to be a little different, is a little different with us is we have a, a product team and we have a um, technology team. A well, product is what you see here. Who's on my team? That's you know, your developers, your dev managers, your product managers. 
and designers. Where's QA? Where's DevOps? Where Gannett, what we do is we have this platform of service team. Test automation actually aligns up underneath platform of service. We embed ourselves into all the teams. We know we're experts in all of our tools that we're rolling out. We're trying to help the team to optimize that experience. I'll touch a little bit more in the next slide about some of those responsibilities, and then later I'll talk about you know, the whole responsibility of a test automation engineer at Gannett. So continuous integration ownership. Before, it was just some individuals, typically a release manager or someone in DevOps kind of trying to control the whole operations. And, only, and QA was never involved with this process. Or when something would break, then, hey, this test broke. Can you come and help me fix it? And that was the only involvement that QA had some developers. Where our new change is that community aspect. Everybody on the team is kind of responsible for this, from test automation engineer to a you know, developer or even a, a, you know, a site reliability engineer. So some of those responsibilities that I was talking about, so in our new model around continuous integration is our test automation people are creating the Jenkins server. They're helping create the workers based on what product you're working on but they're also really writing the actual CI script to help orchestrate your whole pipeline. Developers know the application a little bit better. They know how to set up your machine. So they're taking more of the responsibility and sharing it with our test automation engineers how to build the Jenkins workers. But lastly is our PaaS embeds. These guys are more there to assist on using Chef, all the tools like Scalar, how to optimize that experience. So we're making sure that we're doing everything possible to optimize that experience of getting the product from you know, development to pre-prod and production. So defining that single path to production is that one, one of those things you have to sit down and start collaborating as a team. And as you see here, kind of in the fade, it is an old way. There used to be multiple handoffs, right? The new way for us is about having those many iterations, fast iterations, getting feedback as fast as possible by shifting left. But to make this single path to production possible, it's kind of broken down into like kind of a few areas. Infrastructure is the key for us. This is about creating that self-service model that is repeatable and disposable. So the PaaS team spends a lot of time making sure all the tools they roll out work as expected. And to do that, we're building a lot of testing into that. We write a lot of unit tests, a lot of service spec tests to make sure when we deploy a tool, it did everything it was supposed to do from downloading, installing, whatever that tool is supposed to be doing. So if I'm using Chef and I'm trying to download an Android SDK and I tell it to go get 21, 23, 23, we've built in a bunch of testing around that to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to. So then the teams that are adopting these are having a, a, a great experience. I think a piece that I've like kind of inserted in here, and this is somewhat manual, but I think it's a very important piece as you're building that single path to production is pre-commit. Test locally before you actually create a pull request. And that's not just running your unit test, it's about running all the tests as possible and making that experience easy. By using our new infrastructure with CI, you can deploy it on a production environment really easily. So it allows them to test sooner. Have people start doing code reviews before you create that pull request. And then the last phase over there in the white, and that's your kind of production stage. And this can vary from product to product, but We'll go a little deeper into each of these stages here in a second, but you know, your commit, your acceptance, your capacity. You know, maybe you have some exploratory if you want to do it. And then the path to production. So the items listed here are some of the best practices of what we've listed out of how you would define a continuous you know, testing strategy. And this is a, a guide, a blueprint for the teams to kind of start following. The goal was for us to kind of start shifting left. By shifting left and testing more continuously, it's going to give us that instant feedback on quality. And it's going to reduce the risk and it's going to build that confidence in the team. And your whole goal is to kind of release you know, cycles much faster. But to shift left, you have to talk about what you're going to build in 
for quality standpoint. And there's other things I may not have listed here, but these are just a checklist what the team needs to think about when they're building out the strategy. Do I have testing on the infrastructure? Is my unit testing you know, in place? As Simon said earlier today, Selenium is just the last, the cherry on the top. It's about having those lower level tests. It's going to get faster feedback, and we're making sure we're building those applications to be more testable. This is just some of those layers. But now the trigger points. What tests am I going to run? I want to commit, a create a, a pull crest, a, a merge of a pull crest or deployment. For me, I feel like we should be testing on all four of these, and then you determine what you want to feed in and there. To make this all possible is DevOps, making sure we have that disposable infrastructure. We can spin up a server whenever we want to, on a dev environment, a production environment, it doesn't matter. But that whole process is automated. We've also added a lot of monitoring into this process. This allows us, when we're rolling up Jenkins, to make sure that that experience of load that we're doing, like I told you earlier, if I'm trying to spin up 120 apps and build at the same time, I need to make sure that that experience is going to be good and we got the servers you know, size right. Because that's all you need to do is that to fall over and then that experience kind of like people don't trust it as much. And so with our monitoring, we've done a good job around understanding the, the hardware. But the thing now we're trying to do is build in more of a visual dashboard for teams to understand what's the, what is the, the health of our build? What tests are failing so we understand if there's some flaky tests or there's things that are breaking? And the other thing is practicing blue-green deployments. Lastly, environments. In, in the strategy, you should really be thinking about testing on all three of these. So as you, now we have figured out, hey, this is my single path to production. I've now thought about how I'm going to do my testing strategy, right? But now, how am I going to put all this together from a continuous integration standpoint? So we're built on a self-service model. We, use, we have hundreds of tools on our team. And most people, when they look at our tool belt, they get a little overwhelmed. But it's about when you take in those you know, subject matter experts and saying, hey, what should I do to build this pipeline? And so what our team has done a really great job with is in ensuring <clears throat> that we're building, enabling teams to move at their own desired pace and pick what tools will work for them. And then we're kind of consulting and meeting with them to understand if they're making the right choices. But the one important thing, if we've had all of these tools, the two tools that are most important to us are Chef and Scaler. Scaler allows us to kind of control, manage all of our cloud infrastructure. In the, and then Chef is, allows us to kind of figure the servers however we want by creating a bunch of Chef cookbooks. And like I mentioned earlier, all these tools, what we do is we build interactive labs, workshops. So if you're a new employee on our, my team, you spend your first two weeks going through all of our labs just to get familiar with the tools. You understand how we use it in our ecosystem. So now you understand what tools we have. Now it's that time to start designing your CI architecture. So it really starts over on your guys' right-hand side, is, you know, using Chef. We use Chef to configure our servers to install, download, and this could be spinning up a Jenkins server or like those workers. We're in the beta stage of using Docker. This allows us to move a little faster, spin up servers when we need them, and maybe, not really maybe, it's going to help us actually control some of that cost because we don't, we're only spinning up servers as we need it. The kind of now we have all this here in place is about that cloud management. Scalar sits on top of Amazon cloud, you know, a cloud platform or any of those cloud solutions. This allows us to control when to auto scale up servers, when to spin them up and down. And so this allows us now to have a repeatable and disposable infrastructure with Chef and using Jenkins is from that standpoint. So Jenkins is just one of the tools that we have for CI. We have another team that's using Drone, and they kind of follow the same process. But the Jenkins workers, using Chef, we're able to, whatever the team wants to do, we've built all these cookbooks to where it's a self-service, and 
they kind of can plug in what they need to in this architecture. And as I'm building and creating artifacts that I need to, you know, from compiling and all the tests pass, we push our artifacts to a repository called Artifactory. This allows us to manage all of our artifacts that have been marked ready for production. You know, cloud testing. We're using Sauce for all of our browser. I mean, yeah, for all of our browser testing. We use other testing solutions for mobile from AWS Device Farm, a little bit of Firebase um, from Google. So, part of this disposable disposable infrastructure is about making sure Jenkins is backed up. If anything ever falls over, we need to restore Jenkins, respin it up. We back that up in S3. As long as S3 doesn't go down again, we're fine. Um, that day it didn't hurt us, but you know we have to think of other you know issues you know ways to counterbalance that a little bit. But you know we're using that to where you can go into Scalar today, and if I wanted to spin respin up my server, I can respin it up using the S3 backup, and you're back up and running in 15 minutes, and it's exactly the same as what it was before. But wrapping this whole architecture, we use New Relic. This allows us to aggregate our logs, events, or any metrics we want to capture through this whole pipeline. Today, you know, we monitor our hardware, making sure that they're sized correctly. We spend a lot of time, especially like we want to know a Jenkins worker, how many executors can I have on that worker? What size does the machine need to be? It took us a while to find that equal balance, and every team's going to be different with this. We use GitHub. We, we want teams to kind of use webhooks. So when someone pushes or commits code, we can, set, we can kind of customize a webhook to know when to actually trigger the pipeline. So now we've kind of you know, thought about our architecture and how we're going to roll it out. We, we, we need to make sure that all the teams are following the standards that we roll out. We want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. With multiple teams, if you don't have standards and put in place, you're always going to have someone kind of going, forking off and doing their own thing, right? And so one of the things that I'm going to kind of talk about is some of the standards we've rolled out to our teams, and there's many more, and I'm going to highlight the ones we think are pretty important to us. Well, with Jenkins today, you can kind of create these, you know, kind of freestyle jobs and then kind of daisy chain them together to create a pipeline. Well, with the new Jenkins, you have the Jenkins pipeline file, and this allows us to have a single pipeline, you know, orchestration of how we're going to get to production. So we're trying to recommend this to teams. We're coaching them how to write these because there's very, it's just like, it's coding. You, you got to make sure you have standards around that. Making sure the teams are pushing artifacts to a cloud repository, not leaving orphan artifacts on our servers. And by doing that, we're tagging those and saying, okay, this one's ready for you know, production. Because we're going to CI. We're not in continuous delivery. We need to mark stuff to make sure it's ready. Notifications. How's our pipeline? Is everything passing, failing? We use Slack. We send you know, detailed information. Who created the pull request? What test failed? You know, where was a tag? What an environment? And lastly, we've also built some custom tools that allows us to also notify the team, hey, there's a pull request ready for review, rather than us trying to hunt them down and have people review it. Auto-scaling. Um, we're using a, a plugin called Swarm. This does auto-discovery. As in Scalar, we can set, hey, I want 28 servers at max. So what we've done is we built custom scripts to notice when the Jenkins queue gets above 10, it starts automatically spinning up Jenkins workers. And as soon as that threshold hits, it starts spinning them back down. Backup automatically happens. Making sure that if something falls over, we can get our machines back and up, you know, back up and running really quickly for the team. Disposable, I've talked about it. It's making sure that we have an infrastructure put in place that allows the teams to repeat this and you know, be repeatable and disposable so I can tear stuff down and then spin it back up. And that's really important from our Jenkins workers because we only want to keep one Jenkins worker up and running as of right now because of cost. If you're in Amazon, you're up and running, you're getting charged. 
we're hoping when we move closer to Docker, we won't have the workers really sitting around there with Docker containers. We'll be spinning those up on the fly. Monitoring, I mentioned it earlier. Um, our Jenkins sends a lot of information over to New Relic to where we can build you know, dashboards based on the performance of our whole pipeline. And this is automatically built into this. So if you're a developer and you're going to roll out a new, you know, you know, a CI server or anything, this is all built into how we've architect our chef cookbooks. Optimization, and we're always looking for ways to try to improve. So we're always looking for new ways. So we try to get that out to the team so to ensure they're creating this, you know, optimal experience. Webhooks, rather than using a cron job and trying to keep checking to see if a, you know, something's been checked in. Webhooks is, uh, is standard because then we, it knows when to actually trigger our builds. Managing secrets um, with Vault, really important. SSH keys, API keys, don't hard code them into your repo. This allows us to where we can you know, call their API and retrieve it and you, it, it gets you a little bit more secure. So security is really important even from us. Automatically having LDAP, if I respin re a server, users can log automatically back in. They won't have to do any configuration. The only request lately is to get Okta to where they can be outside the firewall and not have to use our VPN. I have many more if you want to talk later. We, I can talk about more of these you know, standards we've rolled out. I and mean, we have tons of documentation around what teams should be following. But best practice of really getting started for someone. You know, test automation engineers need to know what preparation they need to do to get started. What key concepts? Well, our key concepts have been somewhat clear already. You know, we have Chef involved. But this is what a little different. I have a uh, test automation architecture, I, architecture team with three people. And we maintain the utility cookbook. This is about making sure that we're doing everything we need to do with Jenkins in the sense of you know, deploying it, downloading everything. And I'll talk about some of those features in a few minutes. But if you're a product team, you're using a role cookbook. And this is a bunch of includes of utility cookbooks of how you want to use it. And Scalar, managing it by creating a, you know, a Scalar farm that has a bunch of farm roles. And I'll kind of go into more detail in there in a few minutes. Preparation, as you're getting ready, you know, what access do I need? Having all this information out front helps that experience for test automation, but that community of the team, they know what tools are in that, you know, the whole architecture. SSL certs, you know, making sure that our Jenkins is secure. Yes, I know it's Jenkins, it's sitting in, but if you're not hiding your secrets, then people could still kind of hack you. Um, AWS IAM, we use this instant profile and cloud formation for our backups. And like I said, a, a service account, um, don't tie it to your developer email. <laughs> uh, people leave all the day, right? So make sure that you have credentials to where people can kind of reuse it as a central piece because every application is going to be a little different. So responsibilities, now we're going to kind of talk about the new experience with test automation. And these numbers are very arb arbitrary in the sense of what you see up here on the board. Um, but our goal is the team owns quality. And to do that, 50% of our time is focusing around writing automated tests, but also help coaching the developers how to create an automated application to where it's more testable, right? But also working with the team to what, what acceptance criteria tests we need. What type of testing do we need to put in place? But as you see at the bottom, they're also responsible of creating the CI pipeline. You know, making sure, thinking about that architecture, working with my team to make sure to, they're putting everything in place. You know, defining that continuous testing strategy. We have a blueprint, but that can vary and change, and you have to learn to adapt to those changes. Chef development. It's pretty simple. They just got to create a role cookbook, and then after that, the maintenance, the maintenance is really where my team continues to harden up the Chef Utility cookbook. And that's just really changing some of the PIM versions from you know, 4.0 to 4.1. But they're kind of still responsible for that. And cloud management after, and I'll show you in a second, is pretty simple. Um, 
you're creating a farm and it has the farm rules and it's about how many servers I wanna spin up and, and they really kind of help contribute to that cloud management for the team. The last one's only 10% and I also feel like this one could be a little larger and that's really, we do a good job of documentation but I feel like this is where the team writes, you know, has, you know like blog posts, you know, documenting about what tools we're working on but building those self-paced you know, labs. This is also about educating the developers because they're taking on some of that responsibility of writing tests. So the developers there, you know, they might be writing some UI tests. We're not on the hook to write all of them, and that's that community effort of how we're trying to change that culture a little bit. And we're trying to guide them to how to build that strategy. So to dive a little deeper into chef development, we have a utility cookbook and it does lots of things. If you, re you can kind of control what version of Jenkins you want to actually deploy. You could download or install the latest you know, release or a stable version. You have more control by that by using you know, Chef Roll Cookbooks by overriding the attributes. We've built in, we enforce the team to use SSL certs. If you don't have an SSL cert, SSL cert you can't deploy your Jenkins server. We do nightly backups. Some of this stuff I'm being a little bit repetitive, but these are the things that we roll out as an experience for our team. So it's very clear when they roll it out, we've done all the heavy lifting on my team and it creates a, a better experience for the people that are using our tools. We do a better job of actually standardizing and recommending what plugins the team should use. They can use whatever plugins they want to, but we've already vetted out what we thought would be the best experience for you, and so we're spending the time up front to do all that. We make sure that our whole chef infrastructure is using the latest Tomcat, Nginx, making sure it is compatible. And before we release and make changes, we're testing that out before we roll out to the team. So it's really important as you're creating a role cookbook, you're pinning your stuff to a particular Utility cookbook. And last part of like you know, the chef is we do a good job of creating all these guides and documents and making sure that the experience is best as possible. But the Jenkins workers can vary from team to team. If you're on the Android team, you want to make sure that I have a utility cookbook that allows me to download the Android SDK Studio, build tools, SDKs. And this, you know, this particular cookbook allows the teams to build and test. If you're doing a node or go, we've built all, every, whatever tech stack you're using, we've built a utility cookbook to where the teams can use a role cookbook to apply it to their pipeline. So cloud management, to kind of give you a better picture of what Scalar does. If you go into Scalar, you can create a Scalar farm, you can name it whatever you want. This here, I'm using an example of Android Jenkins. And then a scalar farm is just a role that is <clears throat> basically a Jenkins master and then you have the slave. And then you can fine tune what cookbooks you wanna bootstrap to that. You can also tell it what, ser what size the server needs to be. When auto-scaling, as you can see, you can set that auto-scaling to whatever number you want it to be. So it's about, for us, it's about how many servers do I need to spin up to t build and test all of our apps. So to dive into this a little bit and get some terminology, basic terminology, nodes and stage. A node is kind of a way to restrict to a particular node when you're building. You may only, typically you wouldn't maybe do this all the time, but maybe you want to restrict it to a particular node because you want to upgrade to a new version of Node.js and see how your application works. This way we can kind of pinpoint that to that particular node. If that's not important, you can leave it wide open. So if I have 40 servers up and running, it'll start distri di distributing the load across those. The stage is really about what I'm trying to orchestrate. Later, earlier I was talking about all those different stages from you know, commit and you know, acceptance. But as you start you know, defining and scripting out your pipeline, this is of a checklist of things you should start thinking about. You know, restricting the builds. You know, is there any particular repositories I need to pull in? You know, installing the build. 
dependencies, you know, compiling, running tests. These are the things you need to think about as you're starting to create the script. And an example you see here today, like for that script, this is very generic, and it's hard to get a lot of line of code on a presentation. But you know, this is a good example of, hey, I got a commit stage, and it has a stage of where it maybe run a linter on a Ruby project. I mean, my next thing is to actually build the application. So I'm writing, you know, calling some line of code there. And at the end, finally, I'm notifying the team by sending that uh, Slack notification as our responsibility is to kind of define that all in that single file. It's important to us that for teams to be successful. Our vision is to help them, enable them to meet their desired outcomes and goals. And so what we do typically is every other month, we spend time interviewing the teams and sitting down saying, what's working for you? What's not working for you? And that gets things on the roadmap for my team to ensure that they're going to have a better experience moving forward. So we continue to seek ways to improve. As I talked earlier, we're introducing Google. So if Amazon ever falls over, we can instantly in Scalar flip over to Google. Doing more new Relic stuff that helps us monitor stuff. Victor Ops that allows us to you know, page developers when stuff goes down or the Jenkins server went down. Or someone's on vacation, it will notify someone else. Stage pass, <clears throat> status page allows us to, you know, when we're going to do maintenance, that informs the team. Kubernetes, Docker. So we're always constantly trying to find new tools that embed into our CI pipeline. Because it's very important for us to build the best quality apps and find the most efficient way to get there and build faster and shift as much as left as possible. We have many open positions, so if you're looking for a job, we have 11 positions on our PaaS team and test automation. So, or just hit me up and I can help you and direct you to the right place. Lastly, if you have any questions or if you want to share some tools that you're using, this is the time to do so. sometimes providing several different solutions and looking for things. You also just talked about a very large team and a lot of work. What type of, uh, what are some of the metrics? You, you, you mentioned that you use New Relic. Yes. As kind of a gathering tool. What are some of the metrics that you have in your pipeline that you use and you watch? Um, so it, it, there's two sides of that. Um, one is about the hardware. Is the hardware performing as expected, right? Um, that's one metric in the sense of tagging information coming in based on CPU load, based on the load of like users. Um, so we use a new relic for our CI pipeline, but also for real life scenarios too. Um, it was critical for us to use new relic during election time to understand the load when to actually spin up things. So we've been a big heavy chef you know, development team so far, and that was the first time we kind of used it. We felt confident of using Kubernetes, we actually probably, I, I don't know the, the exact number of 69 or 72 is in my head. We made that many updates during between 6 and 8 o'clock that night and constantly building testing and releasing back to production. And using New Relic allowed us to find those errors. The same thing as our pipeline. So we have a lot of alerts around setting this pipeline and sending those alerts to the team and informing us when things are kind of going wrong. Um, the other thing that my team is doing a good job right now of trying to build these collectors around continuous integration, around actually Jenkins and seeing that information over to we know we've built this many times today, it's passed 95% of the time. Now, why did these other 5% fail? So we're able to trace back that information a little bit more. Um, we're pretty much using almost all the suites right now with New Relic and at the beginning stages of using it. Right here, front. 
Um, I have two quick questions. Um, you mentioned you, you are monitoring the state of the CI servers, essentially the uh, Jenkins slaves. Yes. Um, how are you doing that? And you mentioned Swarm for auto-scaling. Yes. Is that an open source tool or is that a, a okay. commercial tool? All right, so for the first one, um, what we're doing is we're dropping a, a, a New Relic plugin that my team has worked closely with the New Relic team to where we can drop it onto the box, and that's auto-configured inside our Chef cookbooks. So when we deploy a server, it's automatically including that and it's providing that monitoring already. To the second part, the Swarm, it's a plugin. So if you go out to Jenkins, um, you know, documentation and look up plugins and just type in Swarm, you'll find it. Um, the only thing we had to really do is open up some security ports and work with a security team that allows us, when things are being other discovered, that we're following their protocol around security. Okay, perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, have you achieved zero downtime on your CICD current state? <laughs> Zero downtime. I, I will say 95, 98%. Um, and the reason we um, don't have a handover, low, balance, low balancer set up, but we definitely could. Um, it's something that it doesn't go down that often. I, the only time I ever see our Jenga server go down is when one of us go on vacation or I'm here and it goes down for a second and you're like, what just happened? Um, we can, it's easily to configure with a scaler to create up a load balancer so it could auto automatically switch over to the other one and we would have zero downtime. But based on my experience today, we, the downtime has been very minimal. Uh, anything else? Great question. Um, so the security team sits pretty much right aside the platform and the service team. Um, they pull us in all the time because they're always trying to build out testing strategies. Um, our security team has been a very small team and we're starting to ramp it up more, but they're actually being pulled into the conversations as much as test automation. Um, I'm in a lot of meetings every day with all the teams to understand they're building the right strategy for around testing from you know their product, but that's when security is also being involved in those conversations too. Um, and right now that team, you know, they've hired a few people and they're working with me really closely around to make sure that they're building in some security, you know, scans and making sure that, you know, if someone's creating a Docker file, it's following all the right protocols that need to be, not using a public image, but kind of creating a more private golden image that they should be using. So we're working with them pretty closely every day now. Up front. We got about one minute. So you mentioned something about GitHub uh, webhooks. Uh, yes. So uh, in our company also we are using webhooks, but the problem we faced was we don't have a local environment. So we don't encourage people to use desktop or laptop based environments. Uh, most of our environment is cloud based using Ansible and Docker containers. So when we placed our webhooks, we hate the fact that, of course, it's creating environment again, and that's that person environment, but we also use to trigger test. But since we don't have a local environment and everything is cloud-based setup, we have to commit and push for every change. So sure. how do you balance out that, you know, we bring in Docker containers, environment, using webhooks, perfect. How do you balance out the test part where there's a delay where you know, every comment and push is actually triggering a lot of tests. So. It's way easier if you're not doing a local development. Um, yeah, but local development, um, one of the things we've been trying to do more um, from the Docker standpoint is they're able to spin up a local environment using a container, and it's the webhook is not much involved with the lo you know your local development. It's more tied to more of the creating of the pull request, tied more to merging the pull request. Um, 
some of the teams do own commits, but then, then that gets into that really gray area of like, okay, now I need to spin up some local dev environment. Um, we haven't done much with webhooks around the local dev environments. It's more been around the pull, actual pull request. Um, it's definitely possible that where a team with Universal Web is using it with using drone and Docker, and it's been allowing to actually do it in a local environment. All right, that's all the time we have for this uh, talk, and so we'll be back in five more minutes.